All right, guys, welcome to another Game Loons review. And this time we are going to be looking at Outriders. Uh, before we begin, of course, we always appreciate a like and subscribe if you can. So right off the bat with this game, before I really get into it, I'm gonna separate this review into two parts because at this point, a few weeks after launch, at least for me, it really feels like a tale of two experiences. I don't wanna go into too much detail about the end game for right now. I'll go ahead and save that for the second half of the video. So we'll focus on mainly the base game for right now. So Outriders does the rare thing in the video game industry that it feels kind of sad that I want to even praise, and that it seemingly is a complete game right from the get-go. This game is a looter shooter, and some people may even classify this as a live service game, which I really wouldn't label it as, because there are no microtransactions bogging down the game. It's, it's not trying to sell you a season pass at launch, and most of all, it's not selling some BS roadmap that's probably never going to happen. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> the only thing that even makes it resemble a live service game is the fact that it's always online. With Outriders, you get a nice little campaign with a beginning, middle, and an end, with a main story and some side quests. It's not gonna blow you away in terms of writing. And now that I think about it, throughout the, I would say 20 to 25 hour campaign, there are really no big surprises. I could really point out, well, maybe one reveal that I thought it was kind of neat, but it wasn't like a huge thing in my opinion. But other than that, nothing is going to really surprise you if you are familiar with these types of stories. It's very much feels like these B tier sci-fi adventure movies that you can just turn your brain off and enjoy. I've said this to some of my friends who have played the game and Outriders feels like a game from 2012, not 2021. This is a video game story with video game characters. Go there! I know it didn't be laughing. Mulk. Ah, he's shirtless. That's how you know he's evil. Altered. I'm not going to be thinking about it for forever, like say The Last of Us or Nier Automata, but I will remember having fun with it and absolutely dying at some of these really stupid moments in this game. Today, we shall see victory. Oh, this guy. A great new altered fights at our side. Together, we shall fuck them up! <laughs> oh my god. Oh shit. So, let's start from the top to make this simple. So let's talk a little bit of graphics first. Uh, I was actually initially turned off by the graphics for Outriders. Everything looked kind of washed out. There was a lot of brown, uh, especially in the starting area of the game. So I will say that Outriders doesn't leave the best first impressions graphically, but the game does get better in terms of diversity in the areas that you visit. I would say that by the time you're done with the campaign, you would actually visit quite a few different places, which actually leads me to the next thing I wanted to talk about. Remember when I said that this game feels like it comes from 2012. Well, that's not all good. Maybe it was my blind optimism that this maybe would have changed when the full game came out. But when I first up opened the map in Outriders a month ago during the demo, I was actually surprised. I was I was stunned to see how bad this map was. It's a completely useless relic. To be fair, on some level, I get why this map was designed like this. Outriders is divided into mostly little hub areas that don't have a lot of branching pathways. It's all fairly linear, so I'm thinking that the developers thought, hey, there isn't much here. It's not like these guys will get lost. They're right to some extent. You can generally find your way, but you definitely want some quality of life when it comes to your map. And it simply doesn't exist here. The map can't even do basic things. You can't zoom in or zoom out. You can't even put like custom trackers anywhere. You can't even get a precise location of where you are. You only get a text saying that you are in this area. There is a quest tracker though, as in you press a button on the directional pad that allows you to see the location of where you're supposed to go. Sounds convenient, right? Bad part is that it works maybe 60% of the time. Far too often it led me to some absolute dead ends or I was tracking the incorrect quest and no matter what I did to get it to track the correct one, it never changed. It leaving me to use a useless map to find my way. 
These are not game breakers by any means, but the map is one of those things that feels like it simply wasn't well thought out and certainly wasn't well implemented and works against the player more than it actually should. Which gets me to another point. Once again, the whole 2012 game comparison keeps coming up. This game feels very messy in terms of structure. This game has a lot of little hub areas like I mentioned before, all of which are separated by loading screens. Most of which are fairly short, but still it adds up as you play the game. Every area you go to has a loading screen. It feels very noticeable because let's face it, most gamers like myself are just used to more seamless gaming experiences and Outriders is not it. Because of this structure, personally, I was even more disappointed because the game makes an effort to make you feel like you're on this trek going further and further into the unknown with this like ragtag group of people and traveling from one location to another getting closer and closer to your goal but it just feels a little jumbled with all the loading screens and the little sm the small little areas i would say the one good thing about this is that the side quests in this game kind of benefit from that structure i was actually surprised by this because each side quest literally has their own like designated area specifically for that quest so you won't be revisiting an area and just killing a different enemy and the game calls it a quest. As far as I remember, each of these areas were designed specifically for that quest, so props to that to People Can Fly. With that saying, the side quests aren't going to blow you away. You're not going to get super invested in them, but they offer you more loot and they don't usually overstay their welcome and some can even be quite funny. Warning, safety controls failing. Missile launch imminent, warning. Okay, that's not good. What do I do? I don't know. You think I know anything about nuclear bombs? Wait, 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 wait. Is there a refrigerator around? A refrigerator? Yeah, a fucking refrigerator. You know what a fucking refrigerator is? Yeah, 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 I found it. Oh, thank God. Now get inside. What? Get inside the refrigerator. The light will protect you. That is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. I saw it somewhere. That's not going to happen. Now, let's get into the part I really like about this game, and it's really one of its biggest strengths, and that is the gameplay and the loot. When a game has a great loot system, it instantly sucks me in. I am an absolute sucker for these things, and Outriders, at least for the campaign, does it fairly well. Loot drops very regularly, and especially in the early game, I found it a lot of fun to simply try different guns as I picked them up and experimented with the many cool and different mods that dropped on them. And Man, the mods and really the modding system is an absolute triumph in my opinion. How it works is that as you play the game, you will get different guns with different mods on them. What you can do is if you dismantle a weapon or a piece of armor with a particular mod on them, it gets unlocked permanently. So as you go through the campaign, you unlock more and more mods for both your weapons and armor that you can explore and play around with. This allows you to really create some absolute fun and stupid builds. And you can do this right from the get go. This was an absolute highlight during my playthrough. I only played the Technomancer class, but I found myself experimenting quite frequently, switching from one class tree to another and applying different mods to see how it played. And this was just so much fun. And one thing I absolutely have to give credit to is the auto loot system. You can actually go to the settings and choose the minimum rarity you can auto loot. So I set it to the lowest so I can pick up everything. And now all I have to do is simply press the down directional button and I pick up everything that dropped on the map. This one is an absolute godsend. I actually got used to it so much and it was so convenient that I found myself pressing down in other games to pick up my loot before I even realized, oh, I'm not playing Outriders. Yo, why can't I, why can't I pick up my loot? Oh, okay. <laughs> Outriders is ruining me. It's such a simple thing, but it made it so much better. You didn't have to stop to pick up loot. Just press down and when you get some downtime at your camp or wherever, you go into your inventory and check out all the loot you picked up. Like this is awesome. <laughs> Big thumbs up to people can fly for that one. I will say though, it's not all great. If you have seen anything about Outriders, it's that it has gotten the reputation of being the third person shooter that actively discourages the use of cover. And that's very evident by the design of the enemies and the encounters. The campaign is a giant horde mode basically. There's no such thing as a small amount of enemies. Every single encounter you are absolutely swarmed with creatures and different types of things that want to kill you. And there is a good variety of them. And they are extremely aggressive. The humans in this game will move around and flank you. They'll come at you with grenades and some will 
charge at you with knives. The monster enemies will try to swarm you and lunge at you. Some of them will stay back and spit venom at you. It, it all feels very engaging and fun. However, I'm gonna go into rant mode. People can fly. Who the fuck thought that giving snipers the most absurd tracking in video game history was a smart idea? The snipers are just the worst. They're the worst. These motherfuckers, these absolute nightmares, are easily to me the worst part of the Outriders experience. Not only do they hit for absurd amounts of damage, they can hit you through walls. They can hit you even when you are in cover sometimes. And you think you can rush them and or, or, or move strategically from cover to cover? <laughs> nope. Their tracking is so absolutely ridiculous that all the fun, all the flow of the game just absolutely dies when a sniper or snipers, and yes, they like to hit you with more than one, gets on the field. The snipers single-handedly changes this game from Outriders to a damn cover shooter. And when they are on the field, it is the only time where I feel I need to use the cover, even though it's only effective sometimes. Not to mention that every time a sniper hits you, it stuns you, leaving you open to attack from other enemies, especially for a squishy technomancer like myself. Snipers never feel fair. They have been jacked up to 100, and every time I die by one of them, it feels like bullshit. Let me put it into perspective. I have died more times due to snipers than any other enemy in the game. And yes, I'm talking about bosses, harder enemies, and elite enemies. The most dangerous person in the game, this game are snipers. All right. Now, with that out of the way, I want to directly transition into the end game. I feel like it would be disingenuous not to mention the severe launch issues that the game has had. I literally could not play the game consistently even a few days after launch. And even now, weeks after, I still get stuck at the sign-in screen. It once took me 20 minutes before I was able to fully get into the game. And as far as I know, the servers are generally fine. But I guess it's just one of those Outrider things that are going to be sticking around for whatever reason. This feels particularly frustrating because the problems that the game experienced at launch, and let's face it, days and even weeks after, did not need to be problems. Now, what do I mean by that? The game has, for some reason, made the decision to be always online. And I can't for the life of me figure out why that is. The fact is that most of your playthrough, you're probably, like myself, going to be playing solo. There are no social hub areas in this game. There are no places where a bunch of outriders are going to be able to meet and show off their gear and their emotes. You won't be meeting random outriders during missions like a share world shooter either. None of that is there and it only seems like it's always online just because. And because of that, many players went through the same issue of not being able to play the game for long stretches of time. And what makes it worse is that online components are not really well implemented, especially at the end game. Don't get me wrong, with friends, this is ridiculously fun, especially if you can get a good diversity of classes. The chaos of the entire screen lighting it up with all these different crazy moves never got old. But in my experience, it was wildly inconsistent. Oftentimes, I would simply be unable to find a match. And this was during the launch window where the community was at its peak in terms of population. And if I did find a match, at most, there would be one other player there who either would be AFK or, you know, he probably accidentally left his matchmaking option on open and kicked me right away. And when I finally got the people that wanted to play, the connection was janky, it was laggy, it, it seriously felt like a pointless endeavor to try to play the game that way. So I ended up going solo for most of my playthrough, and we're talking campaign and endgame. But for some reason, the game still demanded that I be connected to some server to do that. It's annoying, it's unnecessary. And with that, let's talk about the actual endgame activity. 
the expeditions. So I want to give credit where credit is due. I think the end game activity is overall fun, or at least it was for me. How it works is that by the time you completed the campaign, the highest level your gear can drop at is level 42. Now, if you want to go past that level, level 43 and to a maximum of level 50, I believe, then you're going to want to play the end game activity called expeditions. Think of strikes from destiny, but with the more outriders backdrop. For each expedition, you can actually decide which tier you want to play in. Uh, these are called challenge tiers. The higher the challenge tier, the more rewarding the loot. So the goal is to work your way up to challenge tier 15, where the highest level gear drops are, and where you have the best chance of getting legendary drops and where you can most efficiently farm an end game currency called drop pod resources that allow you to buy a few select legendaries at a vendor along with some epic gear that has nice stat rolls on them. I'll start with the good. Like I mentioned before, I did have a lot of fun and there are far more expeditions than I thought. I believe the game launches with 14 in total and these expeditions aren't just missions from the campaign repurposed with harder enemies. All these expeditions are their own unique maps that you will not find in the entire base campaign. I wanted to find more good things, but unfortunately this is where a lot of the problems start to rear its ugly head. So let's start with the very first thing that started to frustrate me. One of the most disappointing differences between the end game and the base game is the build diversity. And this is because of the very structure in which the end game is designed. While, while playing the base campaign and you were learning the game, I was switching my skills a lot, trying different mods with my weapons and armor just to see what worked for me and what didn't. But so many options felt viable. The end game, however, is a different story. So let me explain. For, for each expedition that you undertake, you can fall into three categories by the time you complete it. Bronze, silver, and gold. The higher you finish, the more drop pod resources you receive, and the higher chances you have of getting legendary and epic gear. The problem is that these tiers are time-based, which at the surface doesn't seem that bad, but it all comes down to what this game mode encourages. It makes it so that the only way to play expeditions is to pump out as much damage as quickly as possible. And the fact is that the general community and myself have generally figured out what that looks like, which feels like it has severely limited my potential build options. This type of time attack mode also further adds into the frustration because of the enemy design. Remember the snipers that had perfect tracking and ridiculous damage? Yeah, this bastard is still here and it's especially bad in certain maps. And the monster type enemies are just as annoying as they swarm you relentlessly. And you almost always get overwhelmed. I died more often than not by getting stunned by an enemy that came from behind me and staggers me just enough for another monster to get a hit in. And when you die, you don't get a checkpoint or anything. You have to start at the beginning of the expedition, especially if you're playing solo. This is where the game actively wants you to participate in multiplayer mode. It clearly wants you to play expeditions with other people because in multiplayer, when you die, you simply go down. In this instance, another player can revive you and you also get one free self-revival. So playing multiplayer makes things a lot easier in terms of completion rate. Unfortunately, with the additional people, the enemies become much tankier. It just takes a lot more shots for them to go down. And unfortunately, because of this, if one or two people even in your group don't have the gear or the damage necessary, you are going to take a hit in your time. And this has predictably caused problems. One big thing that started happening frequently was the people who played the Devastator class were simply being kicked from groups because the general consensus was that the Devastator could not do as much damage compared to the other classes. You see how the frustration begins to add up? Furthermore, playing online is just not as consistent as it can be. In my hours of playing, I've had entire games be absolute lag fest. I've been kicked from the game just as I was about to receive my loot. I've been waiting patiently for a third player along with the party leader and watch as he kicked devastator after devastator after devastator. And not to mention, in terms of actually engaging the expeditions, the matchmaking is not only inconsistent like I mentioned before, but poorly thought out. Now, I've been playing expeditions and allowing people to join my games, and I've been consistently failing to get that gold range, which I can easily do solo, but get frustrated when I die to some bullshit. So I try to play with others as much as possible, but more often than not, I'm getting matched with players that are clearly undergeared for the challenge tier I'm at. Outrider simply doesn't allow you to matchmate by challenge tier. It just 
automatically matches you with the highest ch challenge tier you have unlocked, regardless if you're re ready for it. It, 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 it actually boggles the mind that they did not think of simply allowing to choose which challenge tier you want to match make in, instead of praying that whatever you get matched with is capable of pumping out the damage you need. When everything works, I'm really having fun with the endgame, but that rarely ever happens, and it's killing the endgame experience for me. Look, I understand that games experience ups and downs, but is it honestly too much to expect the multiplayer of a game to simply work, especially when the developers clearly want you to engage in it as frequently as possible? I had a lot of fun with Outriders. I enjoyed the story despite its flaws, and I still engage with it almost every day. I still pop in and play some expeditions, and if I get lucky enough to get a good group, I actually lose myself for hours knocking out expedition after expedition. And when I get a nice piece of gear with the stats that I want, especially if it's if it's a legendary, it, it really scratches that looter shooter itch that I have just right. But I feel like People Can Fly may have some brainstorming to do when it comes to the end game. But since this is a review, I want to make my opinion clear. Did I have fun playing this game? Yes. But can I recommend it to people? Yes and no. On one hand, I think the base campaign is worth playing and offers a great time that's not overly complicated that provides you with an awesome power fantasy experience, as well as a great sh looter shooter experience as well. On the other hand, this game can be very frustrating to engage with, especially the end game. So at the end of the day, I hope this review helps you understand a little more about the game. But hey, this is just the opinion of one loon. Well, that's it for the review, guys. Uh, let me know what you think of Outriders overall. Are you still playing the game like I am? Are you experiencing the same issues that I'm having online or with the end game? Any and all comments are very much appreciated. And for me and everyone here at Game Loons, we bid you farewell. Until next time. Uh, is this intentional? Uh, like, what's going on? Watch out. Uh, <laughs> 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 I think they forgot. I think they forgot the effects. <laughs>